Hello everyone, Juxtaposition here. Today's video we're going to examine the uh, career and uh, personality and escapades of Jane Fonda. We all love Jane Fonda. Her real name is Jane Seymour Fonda. We're going to look at her parents, which you know are Henry Fonda and Francis Ford Seymour, who is a socialite or described as a socialite. Her mother had uh, dual citizenship, Canadian and American. Ontario, Canada, and New York socialite. We're going to look at uh, Jane Fonda's um, husband. She had three husbands whom she was divorced from. We're going to look at some of her films. We're going to look at some of her Hollywood CIA social engineering assignments that she was uh, required to do, just like Sharon Tate was required to do all Hollywood actors and actresses are required to participate in social engineering events, which will be publicized, right? We all know that Sharon Tate had a Last Supper with Robert uh, Francis Kennedy before he had his head blown off by a Lockheed Skunk Works employee, Thane Eugene Caesar, at the Ambassador Hotel on, July, on June 5th, 1968. We know that. So there's Sharon Tate, you know, at age 25, having to participate in a goodbye dinner to someone who was running for the presidency against Richard Nixon. And um, so too did Jane Fonda participate with the Black Panthers, the anti-Vietnam War movement, she caught the name coined Hanoi Jane on a very mysterious visit to North Vietnam, surrounded by the North Vietnamese Army in uniform, and of course sitting on an anti-air cannon that can shoot, you know, American planes that might fly over. Although one wonders, how the hell can a Hollywood actress, age 34, invade Hanoi, but the United States Marines cannot? <laughs> I'm thinking that was a staged uh, photo op, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Because that's, that's how my mind works, right? I think if the U.S. Marines cannot invade and secure a perimeter, that nobody can, okay? If the, if the Marines can't do it, Jane Fonda can't do it. However, if it's CIA approved and bank funded, she can do it. And if the United States... Army and Marines are prohibited from invading Hanoi, then I guess they don't invade Hanoi. They got to go through Mi Lai, right? <laughs> All right, so we're going to look at Jane Fonda. And uh, of course, she's going to take us to uh, Huey Newton and Bobby Seal, and of course, Angela Davis, who all seem to go to the same indoctrination centers. And we're also going to get involved with some Jewish people, as all my stories now tend to do. Because Alan Greensburg, uh, the poet, you know, Columbia University, University of California, Berkeley, social engineering Jewish fellow from back east, uh, from New Jersey to be specific. Um, you know, he, he works with Timothy Leary. And uh, he worked with Bobby Seal, and he worked with the Chicago 7. It was just Chicago 8 minus Bobby Seal became but Chicago 7. And uh, there's Alan Greensburg, and he's not arrested, he's not arraigned, he's not charged. But he led 2,000 anti-Vietnam War protesters in the park during the summer of 1968 for the Democratic National Convention. There's Alan Greensburg. And he doesn't do anything differently than uh, Bobby Seale or, or um, you know, all the other cohorts. But he is uh, excluded from the arrest and arraignment process. Just like he didn't get arrested at the Milberg Institute. And she didn't get arrested in San Francisco when Alan Greensburg was part of the Beatnik movement in the 1950s. When they were doing Operation so uh, Sea Spray, which they're doing today. Here in California in 2023, they're still doing Operation Sea Spray. This has been going on for 80 years. All right. Uh, Jane Fonda attended, uh, I'm going to pick up in high school. She went to an all-girls high school 
which is called Emma Willard School College Prep, grades 9 through 12 in New York. And uh, she graduated from there, proceeded to Vassar College, you know, so also in New York State, all-girl college, Vassar. When Jane Fonda graduated from Vassar, she then, of course, attended the Actors Studio in Manhattan. Uh, when she went there, it was located at 432 West 44th Street between 9th and 10th Avenues in Manhattan. Anyway, I realized the Actors Studio has had numerous locations where it's been headquartered. Started out with Columbia Pictures, Columbia Broadcasting Systems, and um, they helped it go with free rent, etc. in their facilities. Then it got bounced around Manhattan a little bit. But it's always sort of been near um, the Rockefeller Center and uh, NBC and CBS. <clears throat> it's always been somewhere between those two locations. And of course, their students go on to work in film and television for NBC and CBS and Paramount and um, MGM, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because one big happy clandestine service um, cult. And Jean Fonda was in that cult. Okay, so when she was a young woman in her 20s, she, she did some films. Uh, she started out in theater, of course, but then quickly did a film in New York, about New York, called Sunday in New York in 1963, the year that John Kennedy had his head blown off in Dallas. That was the first film that Jane Fonda did. <clears throat> Sunday in New York. She then went on to do Cat Baloo, which I have no idea what that's about, in 1965. She then did Barefoot in the Park with Robert Redford. We all know who the handsome Robert Redford is, right? That was in... Uh, 1967. She also did a movie called The Chase in 1966. And then uh, she did, of course, uh, one of my favorites, Barbarella. That was released uh, October 10th, 1968. Barbarella. It's kind of a G-rated porn film. Jane Fonda. <laughs> she was 21 years old, I think, when that came out. Wasn't it? No, she wasn't. Let's see. What was she? She was 31. Well, she was 31 when Sharon Tate was murdered. She was uh, she was 30 years old when Barbarella was uh, released. Her her porn film, Jane Fonda's porn film. She was 30 years old. Watch that film if you haven't seen it. It's a porn film. It's a G-rated porn film. It's pretty funny. It's, it's, it's actually a really funny film. It's, um, what do you call that? Uh, cheeky. It's cheeky. Literally, it's cheeky. All right, so um, then Sharon Tate was murdered. And the reason that that's important is uh, Sharon Tate was murdered mm -hmm. August uh, 9th, 1969. Where was Jane Fonda then? I don't know where she was. She was 31 years old. She had lived at the uh, pool house, you know, where William Garrickson, age 19, the the uh, bisexual, homosexual uh, pet sitter of three dogs living in a 2,000 square foot pool house just above Sunbrook Drive where Oliver Stone parks his car, where Timothy Leary has a home just below that pool house. Jane Fonda lived there with her father living in the main house. Henry Fonda lived in the main house. I don't think they lived on the property very long because that's a Hollywood set, right? That Cielo Drive murder scene. And don't forget, it's duplicated 150 feet down the hill on Cielo Drive next door and part of Sunbrook cul-de-sac. It's part of the cul-de-sac. You could walk from the cul-de-sac to the twin Doppler Ganger home for the Sharon Tate murder scene, which was home to Jane Fonda and her father, Henry. I'm assuming they lived there like 1961, 62, when she was getting ready to do... Um, Sunday in New York. I think she was spending some time at Cielo Drive. Can't verify that. No one can. Um, I mean, it's also, you know, rumored that uh, Baron v von uh, Rothschild lived on the property and that, um, you know, Cary Grant had his honeymoon there with Diane Cannon 
you know, I don't know how many nights they spent there, if any, but certainly they didn't live there. And of course, um, the Paul Revere and the Raiders uh, lead singer, Mark, uh, what was his name? Mark Lane. Uh, he, he lived on the property. He was filmed with the red Ferrari as being presented that he owned the red Ferrari in the garage. Then you remember, that was 1967. Mark Lindsay. Mark Lindsay was the, uh, portrayed as the owner of Cielo Drive Murder House. And he was the owner of the red Ferrari that was parked in the big barn garage, which is a studio storage unit. And um, that that was his red Ferrari. Then two years later, the media told us that that red Ferrari belonged to Roman Polanski. And that that was the Polanski home. Well, that was, that was a lie. That was a mendacity. It's untrue. Rome Polanski, as far as I can tell, he's never spent a single night over there. And I don't think Sharon Tate did either. I think the only night she ever spent over there was the night that she was murdered. I think she spent her nights at 1600 Summit Ridge Drive, where Patty Duke allegedly, you know, had, had uh, use of that home. And she spent nights where um, Jean Harlow's husband was murdered at 9820 Easton Drive, which was assigned to Tom Coomer. You know, the surveillance barber by the name of Jay Sebring. That's where that, that's the beds that she slept in. She also had a condo down on Wilshire uh, Boulevard with Sheila Wells that she shared. So Sharon Tate had a number of places in that general area that she could stay. Didn't have to be this uh, porn set. But you should know that Jane Fonda lived on a porn set for a while with her, with her father, Henry. Perhaps in between wives. Henry Fonda, five wives. So, just wanted you to know that Jane Fonda lived at the crime scene where Abigail Folger was bayoneted 28 times and Sharon Tate was bayoneted 16 times with the M7 bayonet. All right, so she's promoted through the chain of command and um, in July 1972, she magically is transported during the Vietnam War, when the United States of America is experiencing its greatest casualties, Richard Nixon is president, and um, we had 58,000 Americans killed in Vietnam, 1.5 million Asian people killed in Vietnam, we don't count those, 504 murdered at My Lai, we don't count those, but we do count the 58,000 American, American, mostly servicemen, I don't know how many contractors that work for uh, Monsanto or Dow Chemical or Lockheed or Northrop or Bell Helicopters were killed. I don't know. I don't know if that's baked into the 58,000. They never break these numbers down. It's like COVID numbers, right? They never give you the zip codes or the names of the dead people. They just throw out the numbers. So it's like the Holocaust, 6 million. I don't know how they come up with 6 million. That's just a preposterously high number. And 58,000, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it's true. I'd like to audit it personally. I know people got killed in Vietnam. I just don't know the exact number. So the thing is that uh, Jane Fonda appears in Hanoi, and she's given a tour of the levee systems, and she's chiming on that, uh, that um, Navy fighter bombers are dumping, uh, you know, 5,000-pound bombs on the levees, which I know they were doing... 5,000 palm dumps on Ho Chi Minh Trail because one of my colleagues told me all about that. He was a pilot. He flew the plane. He pushed the button. And by the way, they're laser guided. They're laser guided by a propeller plane that has a laser, probably from Raytheon Missile Guidance System. So they're stupid bombs, but they're smart because they follow the GPS tracking by the laser. So they're laser guided with a third, with a, another plane. And there's Jane Fonda, and she's chiming on that the that this is for civilian use to grow, you know, the rice, etc. And this is disruptive. But the thing is, if it was really a war, if the United States America was really fighting a war against the communists, of course you'd destroy the levees and you'd you'd put up toll roads so that all the roads would be controlled. You wouldn't have to drop five thousand pound bombs on the Ho Chi Minh Trail because it would be completely secured, right? So why would we be doing it this way? Why would you, I mean, why are there any levees left by 1972? Wouldn't you take those out in 1964? 
65, 66. What, why discuss the levee situation? This is why you know the Vietnam War was a complete hoax. Yes, people were killed, absolutely. It's not a real war, though, because it would have been over in, you know, six months or less. Because nobody ever invaded. Nobody, the United States Marines never invaded Hanoi. They never secured the perimeter. They never secured Ho Chi Minh Trail. They never secured the Mekong Delta. And there are no Navy ships. There's fisher, fishing boats, okay? And the USS Savage is operating there, and the USS Maddox is operating off Hanoi, and you're telling me the United States Navy can't invade Hanoi? Are you kidding me? They could invade Hanoi in a nanosecond, unless they're prevented from doing so. You're telling me a Hollywood actress, age 34, waltzes in there to do a public relations show and appears on 10 radio shows and gets uh, nicknamed Hanoi Jane? That's a scripted CIA event and in the words of Sean Stone, who's Oliver Silverstein's son, he told me that's, that the concept of herding the sheep is you call, you work both sides against the middle. You work both sides against the middle. So you have pro-Vietnam supporters of a imperial corporate state, which is what the Vietnam was about, colonialism, corporate control, like, you know, COVID mandates. And then you have, you know, these crazy kids that are looking at getting conscripted into a draft and a war that they don't understand, and they're opposed to the war. So you give each side what they want. You let Bob Hope pander to the pro-corporate group with the USO, and Bob Hope's making tremendous amounts of money personally to be a war hawk. And then you have Jane Fonda portrayed as a, you know, free the U.S. Army. I think they, you know, she and Donald Sutherland allegedly uh, started an anti-war group called Free Army Now or something, which also could be portrayed as F Army Now, F-U, whatever. But anyway, Jane Fonda did, is, and Donald Sutherland are not going to be starting any political groups. The CIA is. And then they're going to say, oh, these guys uh, are in charge of it. Donald Sutherland and Jane Fonda. Anyway, that explains the Hanoi Jane situation. Prior to that, they had dispatched her to hang out with Huey Newton, who's the president of the Black Panthers. Um, we're going to get into that in a second. She also was associated with, um, in 2005, with Gloria Steinem, who, if you don't know, is total CIA and was also sponsored for her university training, Gloria Steinem, she's CIA. And Jane Fonda is CIA. And Huey Newton of the Black Panthers, he's CIA. And Angela Davis is CIA. And Bob Bobby Seale, Robert Seale from Port Arthur, Texas, he's CIA, right? And they're in a CIA group called the Black Panthers, which had a, uh, a life of 16 years. It existed from 1966 until 1982. And you know who else is involved with the Black Panthers besides Jane Fonda? You know, Jim Jones! Jim Jones of the People's Temple. You do know there was never a Jonestown, right? There was a CIA base in British Guiana on Union Carbide property called, that's what it reads on the sign over the gate, they have a gate when you enter, it reads, People's Temple Agricultural Project. That's an acronym. That can also be an acronym. P-T-A-P. P-T-A-P. People's Temple Agricultural Project. There's no such thing as a Jonestown. Yeah. And Jimmy Jones, Jimmy Jones, in 1977 was flown to Havana, Cuba. Havana, Cuba. And so was Huey Newton who's attending University of California, Santa Cruz, where he has not yet graduated. He's a junior. He's a junior. And he's flown to Havana to meet with Jim Jones in Cuba. You know, where Fidel Castro, the communist, is under control. How can Huey Newton, who's a college student with no money, how can he be flown to a communist stronghold under Fidel Castro in Havana to meet with preacher Jim Jones, 
of CIA People's Temple and have a little conference. And then later, in 1978, in the so-called Jonestown, they wire Huey Newton's voice to the 900 members of the People's Temple in Guyana, and Huey Newton conducts, you know, a lecture service whilst he is finishing up at University of California, Santa Cruz, where Angela Davis is now a professor. Angela Davis did not attend UC Santa Cruz. You won't believe where she attended university. But anyway, she's a professor at, she's been a professor at USF, Jesuit, University of San Francisco, Angela Davis professor. And she's a professor at University of California Systems, Santa Cruz, which by the way, had the distinction of being the number one serial killing zip code in the United States during the 1970s, Santa Cruz County. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if CIA was involved with some of those serial killings. I know they were involved with Leonard Lake. That's 25 right there. But it wasn't in Santa Cruz County. That was in Calaveras County. You know, where the jumping frog with Mark Twain, who you know was in clandestine services, right? Yeah, just like Alan Greensburg was. Alan Greensburg appears in this story also. But um, good friend of Timothy Leary, Jewish poet from New Jersey, Columbia University, University of California, Berkeley, Alan Greensburg, and also a friend of the Hells Angels and, and the Black Panthers and the Chicago 8. Subtracting Bobby Seale became the Chicago 7. All right, let me just tell you where uh, Huey Newton came from because he didn't come from under a rock, right? All right, so... Uh, <laughs> Oh, Lord. All right. So Huey Newton was was born in um, on February 17th, 1942. So he's about the same age as Sharon Tate. Right. And uh, he came from Monroe, Louisiana. I have a feeling that's pretty close to New Orleans. Anyway, he um, his family moved to um, Oakland, San Francisco, San Francisco and Oakland. In the 1950s, can't give you an exact date. He uh, he went to uh, ended up going to Merritt College, which is uh, in the Oakland Hills, off of Joaquin Miller Drive. It's really quite spectacular, and um, it's a junior college, and that's where he met um, Bobby Seal, who had gone to Berkeley High School. I said Berkeley High School next to UC Berkeley. Uh, Huey Newton went to um, San Francisco Law School, which is a evening school for people who want to get a law degree. Somebody had to sponsor him to do that. And then he went to University of California, Santa Cruz for an undergraduate, and then later a PhD in social phys philosophy, social philosophy from UC Santa Cruz. And like I said, whilst he's um, getting his undergraduate degree at UC Santa Cruz, he is working with Jim Jones of the People's Temple. As Jim Jones moves from San Francisco to Guyana, British Guyana on Union Carbide property with 900 church members and about 175 paramilitary guards and a ginormous pharmacy. And Huey Newton is part of the uh, messaging delivery system remotely. He doesn't visit because Mark Levin Lane from the Bronx does. Mark Levin Lane, who told you what to believe about the John Kennedy assassination, he's in field. But you know what? Huey Newton's cousin, Stanley Clayton, he's in field also with Mark Levin Lane. I wonder if they flew out in the same airplane. Those two knuckleheads along with the 175 paramilitary soldiers who murdered the 918 people that were killed at Jonestown, the so-called Jonestown, People's Temple Agricultural Project. All the murderers got away, and so did Mark Levin Lane, and so did, uh, so did Huey Newton's cousin, Stanley Clayton. He was flown out of there. You can't walk out. It's over 100 kilometers of jungle to get down to Jonestown, which is the nearest port facility, you can't get out of there 
you can't get out of there alive without an airplane. Are you going to swim down the river? I don't think so. They got snakes and crocodiles in there. All right, so what I wanted to tell you is that uh, Huey Newton was not present at Jonestown, but his cousin was, and Huey Newton's voice was. But it's a CIA camp, and Huey Newton works for CIA, and Jim Jones works for CIA, and I assume Stanley Clayton works for, for CIA. Anyway, so Huey Newton fulfilled his role as the leader of the Black Panther movement. Well, if you read their bylaws and their requirements of what they wanted, they started out being anti-police brutality and policing the neighborhoods in Oakland. Um, and then it kind of morphed into whatever the media told you that they stood for, right? With the fist and all that stuff. What I wanted to tell you is that um, Huey Newton was murdered um, at age, I think what age he was when he got shot in the head in uh, downtown Oakland. Huey Newton was killed at uh, 1456 9th Street in Oakland. It's a few blocks from the containerization terminal gate, the port of Oakland, the number one container port. Uh, next to Long Beach. Long Beach and the Port of Oakland are the two top port facilities. Totally CIA controlled. So what I'm telling you is Huey Newton was murdered in a controlled CIA United States Navy port facility. Of course that's where he would be killed, right? So they say, oh, Oakland is such a dangerous place. I had a business down there. I had a business three blocks from where Huey Newton was murdered. Okay, he was murdered I'm going to be real specific here because it's kind of scary about the uh, six degrees of separation. He was killed uh, on, uh, in August 1989, and I had a business there in 1987 and 88, and I got out of there in 1989. Just before Huey Newton was murdered, I mean, I might have seen the murder, right? It happened like at 2 o'clock in the morning, so I probably wouldn't have seen it. But I'm very familiar with the neighborhood, and I'm familiar with the port facility, and that, of course, that is where Huey Newton would be murdered, is right near a CIA-controlled gate. It's just like Long Beach. It's the same setup, right? That's why if you ever hear about people committing suicide off the Thomas Vincent Bridge in San Pedro, where Sharon Tate's father used to have an office, okay, then you know it's a murder, because nobody can, there's no parking areas on that bridge. You've got to get, everything's surveilled on that bridge. You just don't walk across that bridge. There's no... There's no way you're going to do that without, you know, adult supervision. Anyway, so you got Jane Fonda is involved with Huey Newton. Jim Jones is involved with Huey Newton. Ch Huey Newton gets assassinated in a CIA port facility. He is then buried. He is then buried in the green, evergreen cemetery in Oakland near Mills College. Okay. Do you know who else is buried there? 409 corpses from Guiana Jonestown are buried in the same cemetery that Huey Newton is. And you know who else? Several dozen Hell's Angels are buried in the Evergreen Cemetery near Mills College in Oakland. It's not that far from where Sonny Barger lived. See, that's a CIA cemetery. See, that's, that's who gets buried in that cemetery. Huey Newton, the Hell's Angels, and the CIA People's Temple members, 409 of the 918. So like just barely half of the Jonestown victims are buried in a mass grave in the Ember Green Cemetery in Oakland. That's three CIA categories of people buried in the same cemetery. It's very similar to the Holy Cross Catholic cemeteries um, in Colma, where you have Abigail Folger, Enos Mejia, George Moscone, who's CIA fake mayor of San Francisco, Joe Alioto, CIA fake mayor of San Francisco, they're all buried in the same spot in a Catholic cemetery. And then in Culver City, you've got uh, Sharon Tate buried in the Holy Cross Catholic Cemetery, Culver City, for Culver, for Los Angeles CIA operatives. And there's a whole bunch of others. Just look under celebrities buried at Culver City Holy Cross Cemetery. You know, it's the who's who. It's the who's who of Hollywood is buried in there that I guess Catholic. So, 
Havana, Cuba was where Jose Menendez came out of in 1959. 1959, at age 16, Jose Menendez. And then he went on to a CPA career, controllership, CEO of a container company in Cicero, New York. And then he became uh, chief financial officer for Hertz Rent-A-Car in New Jersey and New York. And then he became chief operating officer of RCA, sent to Los Angeles to look over porn and the music business. And then he went 100% porn working with Oliver Stone's friends, uh, Mario Kassar and uh, Andrew Vajna, a.k.a. Andres Weidman, with Noam Bloom as the chief pornographer purveyor. And uh, Jose Menendez became CEO of Live Entertainment, which today has uh, been rolled into uh, Lionsgate and managed by Lori Laughlin's ex-husband. Lori Laughlin, you know who bribed USC to get her daughters in. Lori Laughlin, who lives in Hidden Hills, the gated community in Canoga Park, where Jose Menendez and Kitty were building a 10,000 square foot home on uh, 18 acres of property in there. Yeah. You see a trend here? Jose Perdomo left Havana, Cuba under Fidel Castro. Uh, personal friends with uh, General Batista, but he's not having a problem getting along with Fidel Castro at all because both Fidel Castro and Batista, they work for the same company that Ron DeSantis works for. Ron DeSantis, Fidel Castro, General Batista, the dictator, Jose Menendez, Jose Perdomo, Jeffrey Bezos's stepfather, Miguel Bezos. How many is that? Ron DeSantis, Jose Perdomo, Jose Menendez, Miguel Bezos, Jeff Bezos' stepfather, all came out of Havana and Santiago, Cuba. Mm -hmm. So Cuba is CIA. All Cuba. Not just Guantanamo Bay. Not just the detention center. The whole friggin' country is. And... Um, Jim Jones can fly there, and Huey Newton of the Black Panthers can fly there. And they're friends with Jane Fonda. You should know that Jane Fonda is two years older than her brother, Peter, and that their mother, um, Frances Ford Seymour, she received a divorce decree from Henry Fonda. She ended up in a sanitarium in Beacon, New York, in a place sanitarium called Craig House, whereupon she committed suicide at age 42. And that was on April 14th, 1950. One day before tax filing day is that Jane Fonda's mother committed suicide or was murdered, most likely was murdered, in a Craig House sanitarium. And you should know that Jane Fonda was 12 years old and Peter Fonda was 10 years old when their mother was murder-suicided in a sanitarium-controlled facility when their mother was 42 years old. And it was goodbye, Francis Ford Seymour. And Henry Fonda continued on to marry three more wives. Because Jane Seymour Fonda was his second of five wives. You see now, when I bring up Alan Greensburg, Timothy Larry, Jane Fonda, Sharon Tate, okay? When I bring up uh, Jose Menendez, Jose Perdomo, who killed John Lennon, in case you didn't know. That's who, he was the doorman at the Dakota. Jose Perdomo, who left Havana, Cuba at the exact same time that Jose Menendez, who got into the porn industry and was murdered by CIA soldiers in Beverly Hills in a home that he did not live in. He lived in Calabasas, in a rental house in Calabasas. And he's building a 10,000 square foot home in Hidden Hills, which is Calabasas, Canoga Park. It's the same place. They just like to rename it because they don't want you to think they're in the porn business. They're in the porn business. Now, Bobby Seale, the only thing, uh, you know, he didn't go to the fancy schools like uh, Angela Davis did, but uh, he was used as a tool for the CIA, and he was a co-founder with Huey Newton of the Black Panthers. He was part of the Chicago 8, but then at the trial... They separated him out and tried him separately, so it became the Chicago 7. 
And of course, Alan Greensburg was not part of all that, even though he personally led 2,000 of the anti-war anti -war Vietnam protesters were led by Jewish poet Alan Greensburg, and yet he's exempted. And Bobby Seale was, uh, received a mistrial. He was not convicted of conspiracy to incite a riot or crossing state lines to commit a riot or a felony. He was not convicted. So the judge, a Jewish judge by the name of Julius Hoffman, then convicted him of 16 counts of um, contempt of court and gave him four years, which he served about 18 months in prison. All right. And he's still alive. And he appeared on the Anthony Bourdain, you know, parts unknown television show, you know, um, as did Barack Obama. You know, Anthony Bourdain features you know, social engineering messages like Julia Childs did. Cooking shows are not about cooking. They're about uh, sending you messages and sending you fake history validation that Bobby Seale is a civically minded advocate when he's really working for FBI and CIA. And say so is uh, Barack Obama. I mean, he was a fake president. He's not a real president. It's like uh, Joe Biden. It's like Ron DeSantis. He's like Gavin Newsom. Those are fake governors. Ronald Reagan was a fake governor. He was a fake president. He was one of the best. He's a professional actor. You could have Sean Penn be president, right? Wouldn't that be fun? Sean Penn, another fake, phony Hollywood CIA crisis actor, Sean Penn. He's doing Jane Fonda's job now. Do you see? Jane Fonda was Hanoi Jane, and Sean Penn is the Ukrainian whatever he is. I don't know what he is. Angela Davis, what a piece of work she is. Okay, so she comes from uh, Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama. And um, she gets integrated in with the Black Panthers, right? And um, she goes to a Jewish university in Waltham, Massachusetts. It's called, uh, she gets a scholarship to Brandeis University. My God. And then she transfers to another school. Then she goes to University of Frankfurt, Germany. Then she goes to the University of Berlin. Then she ends up going to the University of San Diego in La Jolla. And then she becomes a college professor with a PhD for University of San Francisco, which is Jesuit near Haight-Ashbury. Haight-Ashbury. And she's also a professor at University of California, Santa Cruz, the serial capital of California. Angela Davis, she's listed as a communist. Her political affiliation is communist. But that's fine because I think that's uh, Joe Biden's affiliation. Isn't he a communist like uh, Diane Goldman Feinstein or Nancy Pelosi? I think they're communists, right? All right, so there's more. Of course, there's more, but I'm going to cut it off now. Just wanted to say it's seven degrees or six degrees or five degrees of separation between Hollywood actors, their parents, their bankers, their social messaging, their assignments, Black Panthers, uh, Gloria Steinem, COVID, Vax, mandates, rituals, cult rituals. They are all connected. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Bye-bye.